changes to the briefing papers or decision alternatives, uh, I would note that uh, representatives from the applicants are here seated at the bench. Additionally, uh, representatives from the Department of Commerce are here for questions and answering questions that we have. Also, uh, representatives from the Office of the Pipeline Paper of the Council, uh, their senior engineer is available for questions, as well as uh, two representatives from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, uh, Steve Lee and Doreen Fire Tucker, uh, who are in charge of uh, spill response planning for uh, these pipelines, are available as well. Uh, the project itself is uh, the installation of a total of five. 6,000 horsepower pumps uh, within three facilities that currently owned and operated by Enterprise Energy to increase the uh, incremental uh, average throughput of the line 67 Alberta Pipeline, um, 120,000 barrels uh, per day to a, a maximum throughput capacity of 570,000 barrels per day. Uh, the application was submitted on October 12 of last year. Uh, the commission put the matter up for comment. Uh, the commission undertook to uh, review the matter using the formal process and the matter to the administrative law judges at the Office of Administrative Hearings. Uh, the Office of Administrative Hearings conducted uh, two hearings in northern Minnesota, one in Clear Brook on March 19th and one in Deer River on March 20th. Uh, a, a hearing that was scheduled for March 18th uh, near Viking was canceled as a result of the on April 5, the Department of Commerce uh, uh, Energy Regulation and Planning Unit filed its comments on the merits of the application of the state On May 3rd, uh, Enbridge filed some comments in response to public comments. And on June 3rd of uh, this year, the Administrative uh, Law Judge, Judge James Lafayette, uh, filed a summary of public testimony. I would note also that there was a voluminous record of, of public comments on the matter. This is a, a, a picture of the three areas of pump stations in question. Uh, you can see the footprint of the line as well as the, the adjacent line uh, in the area where the facility would be installed. Um, I was asked to prepare some information on how the commission makes this decision. I think it might be helpful in this matter to understand uh, what the certificate of need process is designed to do, and, and I'll just go through that briefly before the proceeding. The uh, commission, as you know, is, is uh, the authority to grant approval for large energy facilities because of the construction in the state. Um, and this project, because it would increase the throughput capacity, would uh, require a certificate of need. Uh, the certificate of need proceeding evaluates the project size, type, and time. It's primarily an economic and reliability analysis and, and more or less focused. Uh, and in this case, in particular, the project would be entirely contained under the existing footprint of the energy facility. The project is also subject to review by the U.S. Department of State. There's a presidential permit application pending before them, and that includes the environmental impact statement, which is currently uh, underway as well. Uh, the criteria for uh, approval of the certificate of need is contained in the Minnesota Statute 216B, in particular, uh, 216B.243. The Commission interprets these and establishes criteria as defined in rules. Here we have Minnesota Rule 7853.0130, uh, which establishes the criteria for the Commission's decision. Uh, there are four criteria that uh, are contained within this area. They are not the only criteria that the Commission uses, but they're not used. Also, a uh, question of reliability and net violation of the project itself. Uh, the first criteria is that the probable result denial would be an adverse effect on the future adequacy, reliability, or efficiency of energy supply to the applicants, the customers, and people in this place, and its neighbors. Not at all. That's for export. That's right. Please. Secondly, the, the uh, commission is uh, directed to grant the certificate of need uh, upon a showing that uh, a more reasonable and prudent alternative to the proposed facility is not to be demonstrated by the Third, uh, 
Similarly, the road closure facility or suitable modification of the facility would provide benefits to society in a manner compatible with protecting the national and social economic security of the South. And finally, the director does not demonstrate that the design, construction, or operation of the proposed facility or suitable modification of the facility would fail to comply with relevant policies, rules, and regulations of other state and federal agency proposal governments. Similarly, as I mentioned, the commission has asked to consider whether the project as a whole provides positive benefits to society and the public affairs and the economic community. Finally, I'll note that commission actions are subject to review both the initial and the annual reconsideration period as well. I realize it's a contentious matter, and there are public officials here available to fully answer any questions you might have. I also am available if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kluge. All right. On behalf of the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Arshad Javaharian on behalf of the applicant. Ms. O'Connell, did you just want to summarize the department's recommendation in this matter on the public comment? Certainly. Our recommendation supports what the department staff has recommended, which is what we had recommended. Basically, that there is a need, looking at the criteria, there is a need for the project. Other alternatives would be more costly or less safe. And that the issue of environmental matters is being reviewed by the following list of agencies. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the State Historic Preservation Program, the U.S. State Department and the Presidential Permit that Mr. Kluge mentioned, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the DNR, Water Permitting, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and that's part of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers review. So all of those agencies with authority over environmental issues are looking at this. Several have filed letters saying that there is no concern from their perspective about what is happening with this project. But as Mr. Kluge mentioned, there are still pending permits. So the issues of environmental matters will be reviewed by the agency with the appropriate expertise on those matters. So if that helps, I can certainly step through in more detail the analysis that we did. It's really what you would prefer. Questions for Ms. O'Connor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do have a question for the Office of Pipeline Safety. Mr. Volchak? Good morning. Good morning. Afternoon. You're right. It's just a button there. Could you just state your appearance, please, and then I just have a couple questions. Yes, I'm here. I'm John Volchak. I'm a chief engineer for the Office of Pipeline Safety. And my question is, for the benefit of the public, could you briefly explain what the role of the Office of Pipeline Safety is in reviewing the construction of an increase in capacity of pipelines in the past and the present? Sure. Just to account for overall scope, I'm sort of like the regulatory body in the state of Minnesota that oversees compliance with federal regulations, which would be the DOT regulations that apply to interstate and intrastate pipelines. With this being an interstate pipeline, we act on behalf of the Federal Pipeline Office, or FINSA, the Pipeline Hazardous Material and Safety Administration. In the state of Minnesota, we're an interstate agent for FINSA. And as directed by them, we would carry out routine safety inspections, operations, and maintenance of the line. As far as construction inspections, we were directed by FINSA to carry out any inspections that would be carried out by our office or a FINSA representative. Are there questions from the commissioners for Mr. Wolf? No further discussion. Is there a motion? Madam Chair. Madam Chair, based on the recommendation of the 
department and on the record. What? What did you say? What? Speak up. to answer direct questions. They have some arm waving and uh, what you call ceremonial magic or performative utterances that rationalize the situation. So that is in the Minnesota Public Utility Commission hearings Wednesday, July 17th. Um, the Enbridge Line 67 would carry an expanded amount of diluted tar sands bitumen. Um, the actual secret toxic chemicals in the dill bit uh, are in secret dockets that we do not have access to and therefore there can be no actual viable safety plan for the pipeline. Uh, Marty, do you want to name like a couple places where people can get more information about this? Uh, what's the best place? Just get a hold of me on Facebook, Marty Cobanace on Facebook. Okay, Marty Cobanace on Facebook. Not um, everybody does Facebook. And not everybody does every Facebook. So how about um, the website? Yes, Indigenous Environmental Network. Uh, uh, that's, yeah. All right, yeah, all right. Um, what my question is is that there are there are even so why are they allowed to continue to run oil through that when there's no place 
we actually have a we have a, a 14 by 7 trailer house parked on top of the pipeline. There's nothing Enbridge can do about it because if they come on our land, they will be arrested for trespassing. So that means and you, you guys need to shut them down. As far as so you have contacted Harold yes. or you contacted yep. Finch about the line. Yep. And they said they're going to find start finding Enbridge for every day that that is on there. Because all the enforcement that would be carried out against yeah. any interstate line would be basically how the process works. Is, uh, if you know, I get a complaint from you or any other you know citizen of the state of Minnesota, I take that and I push that. Um, if we're going out and doing an inspection, any kind of violation of notice, the way the process works, you know, I go out, one of my inspections goes out, and you know, we, we go through a checklist that's provided by the feds, and you know, we're going to look for compliance with that. Um, that's the process is if there is a violation, that violation is put to the feds, and the feds carry out any are easements required for pipelines, or can pipelines be operated without easements on land that is not owned by a pipeline company? Are easements actually required? As far as the easements, I in general, I couldn't comment on that. I guess okay. Um, so why do the, easements exist then? As far as the permitting and things like that, yeah, it's not something that you would call within the jurisdiction of our office. Okay. So what about the home? Okay. okay. So you know. Yep. So if you'd like, if you, you want to come see me or any of our other members that are here, sure. we'll gladly bring you on as our guest. Otherwise, you will be considered trespassing. Yep. No, I, I understand. It. If you'd so like if to, if you're willing to actually take take the complaint yep. and shut them it. down, because this permit should not even be allowed. But, you know, understand that you know the state of Minnesota, as far as shutting the line down, that's something that you know. That, that, that's PIMSA's call. No, and when I talk to PIMSA, PIMSA says we don't shut down pipelines. Okay. So yes, there, there is, and we will continue. If we need to, we will do things that will shut this pipeline down. If you'd like, I can give you my card. If you'd like to forward me the information, I can you know, forward that to you. Here's my card. Okay, that's you. How often forward do you expect this pipeline? People, they said they have to shut the pipeline down when there's a fence built across the pipeline. The fence has been up there for six months now. Yeah, if you and it's still running? So where have you guys been? What is your actual job? What our actual Who job is? Enbridge? Enbridge pays for whatever. You know, so we, you do get paid by Enbridge? We, we bill out our time to Enbridge, just okay. like the feds. Yeah. And so, because it's, you know, it's a so that's why you sat at their table and not protect the people that you know are to be our, working for. Our job is to protect the public. Well, you're not hurting anybody. You're allowing poison to travel through these lines, okay? So, you know, having this Here's information from you today, so I can take some information. Where have you been for the last six months when all of this has been This has been very public. We've been okay. occupying the lamps since primary 28. Yeah. Enbridge yeah, knows? This is not... You know, they've never told you. They, they've so had an illegal pipeline installed on a sovereign nation land since it's what, 1949? It's, it's, it's not your land. It's not on Minnesota land. It needs, it's illegally installed. They're lawbreakers. So if you can bring the information to me, you know, via email, you know, have my card. No, please. What's your name, sir? I am John Wilson. Do you work for the Minnesota Office of Pipeline Safety? Can, can we please have a can we please have material safety data sheets on every single chemical that is listed in the secret docket in the secret chemicals in the bill bit? Can we please have the material safety data sheet? How can we have an emergency response plan for any possible leaks from Enbridge Line 67 if every single chemical is not identified? How can you actually develop an emergency response plan? How do you know about the health effects? This was an issue in Arkansas, the fact that these are unknown chemicals that are unlisted, that are listed in the secret docket that we do not have access to. Have you seen the items in the secret docket? Can we please have material safety data sheets of these secret chemicals in the secret docket? I personally have not received any right. information. Does anybody, uh, who in the state government, who in the state government is administratively responsible for the secret chemicals and ensuring that there's an emergency safety data plan if there's a leak from the secret chemicals that are unidentified? Yeah. Who's responsible? You're I'd, have to, I'd have to touch base with the other agencies. I'm not sure if it would be pollution control or who would have to. Obviously, you know, our role would be to review there is a spill response plan. There is a emergency response plan that the operator has. Yeah, yeah, but that's based those but emergency but response yeah. plans, I want to ask a question here. I'm going to ask it. Uh, first responders will be the first, first people to show up on the scene of that emergency, first responders and fire department personnel, yes. and they are to have in their possession material safety data sheets 
for the chemicals that run through those pipelines. They have a book and those sheets need to be in there and we are asking that they be made available to the people that would respond to an emergency because they are the ones that are going to be exposed immediately. And, yeah. and we need to know exactly who has access to the secret docket and who has access to the, the secret chemicals that are in the secret docket because of this incredible public safety hazard which has placed a number of people's health at risk in similar leaks that have happened elsewhere in the country. Which, do you know which agencies have response, who has access to that data and who is responsible for that? secret things that you're talking about, I don't know what... It's, it's a deal bit. It's, it's a closed docket. Yeah. The reason it's important to us is because line 13, you're, they're planning on increasing line 13, which is the southern line to the line. It yep. goes to the north. That is 20 inch line. They're planning to increase from 50,000 barrels a day to 275,000 barrels a day. Okay, we need to know what that is. That is vital for us. Grand, the, the, these 16 and, or 13 and 67 do not go across Red Lake land, but they go right across the street underneath the lake which the lake then encompasses the Red Lake land. Sure. So it is important for us to know exactly what is in that. Not just for that area, but also for the rest of the area. Through Bemidji, um, you know, Cass Lake. If, if, you, if you start polluting that, you're going to pollute and you're going to ruin the entire ter tourist industry in northern Minnesota. With no available emergency plan, unless every chemical is known, it can't even be mitigated if it's not even known what it is. So and your question, I guess, let, let me recap what your questions are. So well, I have first, question. okay, we'll take them one at a time. So your, yours is the, the right-of-way issue and right. having your, your home correct yep. on the, the pipeline right-of-way. Yep. So you're going to send me information yep. on that. Your, I, I, I want to know okay. what all the chemicals, my name is Dan, what are all the chemicals that are listed in the secret dockets on this application, what are the material safety data sheets for every single component of the diluent that tra traverses these pipelines? And because there's no emergency plan possible even if the, the substances are unknown and it's all, it's the secret policy making process that's used to uh, make it more acceptable to the community because the chemicals are obscured so deliberately from the public. Your, your question is, so what are the chemicals? Okay, so and how do you develop there, a plan? If there is a, a spill or emergency response, yeah. are emergency responders being equipped with the information they need? Yeah, do they That's know what chemicals question. they're dealing with? Does the hospital it's know? Because there, there is you know, public awareness regulations that apply, and there are you know, audits on that, and that, that's something I can look into you know, okay. as far as what is required by, you know, we're looking for compliance with the codes. Sure. And the codes that are in place are what we check for compliance with. What's the code for pump and tar sand? Yeah. It, you know, it would be the Part 195 of the Code of Federal Regulations. You know, the hazardous mm -hmm. liquid pipeline regulations that apply. And beyond first responders, I would like to address the fact that these, although they do have easements, these uh, pipelines go across private property that is, and it spills on private property. And those landowners often have workers that are entitled to material safety data sheets that will protect them from that chemical. Um, we can't withhold that information from them. It's required by law that they have it made available um, uh, and, not, and, and not wait until it spills. They need to know the potential for exposure prior to exposure. Okay? Do you know what chemicals are in the diluent? The, the diluent is a mixture, as I understand it. Where's the list, though, on a URL? It was well, a yes or no question. Well, it's not a yes or no answer to it because it's. it's I know <coughs> lots of chemicals. I'm a chemist. I've worked developing hazardous materials plans. I've developed spill response plans. I've developed community right to know plans for reservations in Minnesota. Uh, I've worked on both sides of these issues, and uh, I can tell you that first responders and public safety officials routinely deal with responses to materials such as gasoline and oil where components are, are mixtures of materials. Uh, material safety uh, data sheets typically do not always break down these materials into every particular type of molecule in them. It may be useful to have that information, I agree, uh, but it's not always on those. And, and so uh, the first responders are able to establish what they could call levels of concern to isolate people from hazards and they feel confident that they can do those things with, with Having been a first responder, a paramedic, and uh, also a, a firefighter, I'm well aware of what's available to those personnel and it is often woefully inadequate and we are asking for the highest level of uh, transparency in what is being, uh, what those workers are being exposed to. If you, you know, Enbridge, ha Enbridge consistently says, we go beyond 
the safety standards. So if you're going to go beyond it, we want full transparency on the chemicals that are present. How, how many, how many, uh, how many barrels of oil has Enbridge spilled over the last 10 years? Um, the, uh, if, if there is not a requirement for disclosure of that information, it should be requested as part of the record. And, and that's something that would be directed towards Enbridge. It's not something that we control. It's not something that the Commission regulates. Are, are the elements of the closed parts of the docket of this application, do those contain the trade secret proprietary chemical blend listings? Have you seen the, the secret parts of the dockets for these pipeline applications, and do those contain the lists of the chemicals? The what is in those secret parts of the docket? Well, Why is there secret dockets even allowed in the first place? This, this is what the secret document looks like, and the reason it's secret is because of this word, trade. The, the primary reason for keeping these materials trade secret is that they're usually proprietary and may provide an economic advantage to their competitors if, the mature, if that information is wrong. So we do not have access to the material in this binder right here. This is part of a commercially secret document. Now, does that have chemical information in it? Does it have anything about chemicals? Well, I'm not going to let you film it because I don't Can I see the tabs on the side, at least the indicators on the well, tab? Certainly. You can see okay. that they, they've addressed the various requirements of the uh, Okay. the uh, materials that was part of the application that they respond to each of these, these All right. rules. But there's chemical information in there that we in the public do not have access to. Is that true? Well, I guess Is that true? I mean, that should be a binary. I, I don't know what you have access to or not. Well, that, really we don't have access that to the content of that yeah, binder. Right. We're out here in the public. We do not get to look at what's in that binder. That's the fundamental situation of this administrative proceeding. And it includes chemical information that's pertinent to public it safety. Also includes, if you would like me to answer that question, please run. give me some answers. Okay. Some uh, address materials, an email or something like that, and I'd be happy to respond to you. Put it in a scanner and scan it onto the internet. There shouldn't be trade secrets for pipelines. I yeah, we'll go ahead and give you, you know. It's incredibly dangerous to everyone's public safety. Yeah. That should be on the internet. It's it right there in front of us, email. and we can't read it. It's insane. I, I also have like, it's so dangerous. It's so dangerous. And, and not only, not only do we not know what's in this stuff, it tells us.